really looking for some kids that have not played the Ten Commandments game yet. All right, so if you've already played, back up a little bit. Let's give everybody a chance. Would you like to play today? Come on. You already played? You guys want to play? No? No? Okay, so let's do one, two, three, okay? So we are on the ninth level today, looking at the ninth commandment, which is do not lie. Jackson, you want to go first? Okay, roll the dice. I know, I know, he's just sitting up front here. All right, here we go. Now, remember, it's just like shoots and ladders, except Jackson and the other players can't move unless he gets this question quickly. Are you ready? Now, we're talking about the ninth commandment, okay? If you're visiting a friend's house and you want a second helping of a great snack, but you're tempted to tell his mom you haven't had any yet, which commandment should you remember? What do you think? Ooh, good guess. There's actually nine do not lie. Can you see it up on the screen? Good try, Jackson. Good try. You want to give it a try? Okay, remember we're talking about the ninth commandment. Let's go ahead and roll the dice. All right. Ooh, a big roll. Six. So you answer this question correctly and you can move whichever one you want. Here we go. So you break your neighbor's window with a baseball. Oh! She turns bright red and shrieks, who did this? You want to deny it. Which commandment should you remember? What do you think? Remember, we're talking about the ninth commandment that says, do not lie. Any guesses? Do not break your neighbor's window. <laughs> I'm going to keep that one to you. So do not lie, but you can pick one of those and you six spaces. Okay, good job. Close enough. All right, are you ready? All right, last question. Ooh, a number six again. Here we go. I already read that one. I already read that one. I got thrown off by your wonderful answer. Okay, here you go. If you didn't do your homework, but you asked a friend for the answers to make it look as though you did your homework, which commandment should you remember? Do not lie. Do not lie. He's right. Good job. So you can hang your mark for spaces. So what we're going to learn today, kids, is not only does the ninth commandment talk about do not lie, but it talks about all of the communication that we're involved in, whether that's what we write, what we say, what we hear, what we see, all the communication has to be truthful because our God is a God of truth. And so keep in mind, even when you're tempted to lie, God's word tells us do not lie. Good job listening. I'm going to step over here. Would you hold this bowl of candy for me? So you guys can grab a piece of candy and return to your seats. Good job playing. So pick whichever candy you want. There's a bowl on each side. If you kids are ages 4, 5, and 6, you could go with Miss Renee to rest up with your parents' permission. Kids are excited to go. While the kids are getting themselves settled, if you could please open up your Bibles once again to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We're going to be on verse 16 today. And so if you're a guest with us today, you've really caught us at a good spot for drawing to a close. Did you want to go to a rest stop? Yeah? Is that a good idea? Here comes Grandma. She's got dots. She gets stuck in my teeth. Do you want to go to school? Okay. Thank you, Sam. So yes, we are coming to a close. We have the ninth commandment this week, the tenth commandment next week. But we've studied the book of Exodus, and we've seen how God's people have been rescued from slavery in Egypt. We've seen how they've wandered through the desert, and now they're standing at the mountain of God, Mount Korah, Mount Sinai, and they hear the lightning, and they see the thunder, or the opposite, and they're quaking in their boots because God is giving the rules of life to Moses, and by extension then, it's sort of like I had to tell the kids the rules of the game before they could play. The Ten Commandments are the rules of life that you and I need to follow because that's the way God created us to live. And so let's review where we've been thus far, please, Bill. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The scope there is our relationship with supernatural beings. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself an idol, and you shall not bow down or serve that idol. And that's all about the worship of the one true God. The third you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And that deals with God's revelation, His Word. The fourth commandment is you should remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And that's talking about how we use our days here on earth. The fifth commandment, 
honor your parents is about the exercise and the respect of all authority. The sixth, do not murder, which talks about the physical and the emotional well-being of all people on earth. Seventh, do not commit adultery, which deals with all temptations that could undermine relationships. Eighth commandment, do not steal. Saw that last week. That deals with the possessions that we have in this life. And if you look at that archery target a moment, we know that in the Ten Commandments is the basic statement, but that's sort of like the bullseye, what we're supposed to be aiming for. But it's so much more than that. So everything surrounding that one statement, kind of like the outer rings of the target, is referred to the story. So as I talked about with the kids, today's commandment, the Ninth Commandment, is do not lie. And the scope deals with all communication. We are living in the information age where we are in, inundated day in and day out with all sorts of mass communication. And so how do we listen to that and see that and experience that communication and discern what is true? And when we are in the midst of that, how do we make sure with integrity that we are speaking truth and not telling lies? So if we could have the next slide here. The Hebrew of this passage helps us understand the context in which it was written and given. Literally it says, you shall not answer as a lying witness against your neighbor as in a court of law. And so that's important because, next slide, this is a prohibition against perjury. While the precise reference would be in a legal proceedings, the law had a broader application to lying about other people in general. We see that this command concerns bearing false witness against someone that would cause them unjust injury. This commandment helps to maintain stability in this society because it protects individual reputations. And finally, when it comes to exactly who is your neighbor, the concept was apparently limited to just one fellow Israelite or a member of the covenant, but it was later extended by Jesus to include anyone encountered in this life. And so as I mentioned, we live in this information age. And I want to be honest with you, and I think Jeff's going to probably wrestle with this at some point in the apologetics course, that our society tells us that truth itself is relative. That absolute truth is, is really non-existent. And what is true and right is really kind of up to your point of view. And when someone comes up and says, look, this is what is true, you're going to get a lot of pushback because we live in this relativistic society. So you can go to the next slide. We see in our confession, it asks, what is the aim of the Ninth Commandment? We see that it says that I never give false testimony against anyone. Twist no one's words, not gossip or slander, nor join in condemning anyone rashly or without a hearing. So we're talking about legal proceedings here. Rather, in court and everywhere else, I should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. These are the very devices that the devil uses. And they would call down on me God's intense wrath. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. And I should do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's good name. But that's even harder and harder to do. You know, we have in our smartphones all these different ways of communicating, right? We can post something on Twitter. We can post something on Facebook. We can text someone. We can call someone. We can just send an email. And so communication is an integral part of our life. But have you noticed that now more than ever it seems like lying is sort of okay? It seems like being dishonest is the new normal. Like if I'm sitting on there on, on Friday and the opening day and I post on Facebook, I said, I got this huge 10 point buck. That's a lie. I didn't have one single deer in my sights the entire day, and as I'm leaving the land and it's pitch dark out, we turn on our lights, and there's eight deer frolicking in the woods <laughs> in the moonlight, basically saying, na, 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 you can't get us. It was heartbreaking. I wanted to put on Facebook how I had come and the mighty hunter brought home a deer for my family. <laughs> but that would have been a lie. If I was, let's say, wanting to change careers, and people do all this all the time, and they're posting an online resume. Let's say I'm going for a male modeling agency, and said, oh yeah, I am just so muscular, and I have blonde, flowing hair. That's a lie. But yet so many people do that kind of thing online all the time. 
Why? Because we don't believe that saying the truth is important anymore. I was reading a report even this week that said that the disdain that American citizens have for their government officials is at an all-time high because for the last 20 years we continue to hear our leaders lie to us over and over and over again and eventually you just get cynical because when you hear them talk you think, yeah, whatever. I don't believe a word you say. And so I wish I could invent some sort of app that when you turn on your television or you open up your smartphone, that the ninth commandment scrolls across your image and says, <laughs> do not lie. If we can see the next slide. Though. <clears throat> what I've been arguing for is it's not to rob us of fun, but rather because of God's love for us, that he gave us his law so that we would know how to live the life that God intended for his holy people. So let's take a look at today's passage. Again, it's just one verse. Verse 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And again, this illustration comes to us with the context of a court proceedings. And, and if you've ever been part of a court proceedings, and we saw that when we talked about using the Lord's name in vain, how you walk up there and you place your hand on the Bible and you solemnly swear to say the whole truth, right? And nothing but the truth. We should function like that throughout our entire life, not just when we're on the stand. And this commandment really stresses the appointment that throughout all of our life, we have to be honest in our speech, in our writing, in our communication. But to really understand this passage, we're going to jump through some of the Gospels. We're going to start with the Gospel of John. So if you still have your Bible, I invite you to open to John chapter 8. Now, the Gospel writer John was incredibly passionate about the truth. He wanted the truth to be something that is connected intimately with who Jesus is. And so here we have this scene, chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus is talking to good Jewish folks, people that since they were little kids were raised on the Ten Commandments, and they felt pretty good about themselves. They felt like, yeah, they, we followed the Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have Father Abraham, and, and he had many sons, and I am one of them, and so are you, so let's just all praise the Lord. But then Jesus comes into the situation, and as they say, he upset the apple cart. Verse 31. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know what? The truth. And the truth will set you free. I'm sure we've heard that verse, even sometimes in secular situations, right? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right? We see it all the time. But do people really understand the context in which that verse was given? Jesus goes on to offend good God-fearing Jews. So much to the point where if you look at the next passage you want to look at, verse 44. Because they believe that they belong to Father Abraham. And they believe they're good with God. And they believe that they follow the thing commandments just right. But look what Jesus said. No, you belong to your father, the devil. Ooh. Can you imagine how painful that would have been? They thought they were good folks who followed the Ten Commandments. And you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And so whether we're posting something on Facebook, whether we're sending someone a text, whether we're typing up a resume, whether we're on the phone, no matter what we're doing, when we communicate, and if we make that choice to lie, what we've done is we've allied ourselves with the devil himself. He's a liar since the beginning. Even in the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, they're told, don't eat that one fruit. And then the serpent comes in and says, hey, what's going on, girl? <coughs> Did God really say don't eat from that? Did He really say that if you eat that fruit, you're going to die? That was a lie. And that original sin cursed them, and they were forced to leave the garden. But it started with a lie. That original sin we saw, do not commit murder, how it spread to the first generation of Cain and Abel. Cain got so angry with jealousy that he murdered his brother Abel. Remember, God sees everything. But God says to uh, Cain, hey Cain, um, where's your brother? Where's Abel? <laughs> what did Cain say? Well, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? A dope? God wanted to see 
if Cain was going to speak the truth. But probably the best illustration, and so I want you to turn over to Matthew, chapter 26. It's going to be up on the screen as well. As I thought about, now how can I illustrate the weight of speaking truth within the context that God was saying that all of life is sort of a legal proceeding where we're supposed to swear to tell the truth. The best illustration that I thought of was our brother Peter. Now Peter, if you know anything about Peter, he was quite the guy. He had a front row seat to some of the most amazing miracles that Jesus ever performed. He saw Jesus in the transfiguration when his glory shone through. Peter's the guy that actually walked on water with Jesus. Countless miracles. But now, at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, we have the Last Supper. And we see what happens at the Last Supper. Verse 31. Jesus told them that that very night, you will all fall away in account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go out ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter, being the really pretentious, impulsive one, says, well, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And then what did Jesus say? I tell you the truth. This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me not once, not twice, but three times. But once again, Peter declared, ha, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And let that verse burn into your mind. Peter, using his speech, it all fall away. Even if I have to die, I will never disown you. And all the, uh, the disciples said, oh yeah, me too, me too, me too. And then jump ahead to verse 57. Now again, we're talking about the context of the ninth commandment, speaking the truth in a litigation setting on trial. Jesus was in fact arrested that night. And the disciples scattered just like he said they would. And now, the first of three court cases, Jesus is brought before the religious authorities. Now this first one, in verse 57, this is the Sanhedrin. Keep in mind, these are the experts of the law. These are the people that know the Ten Commandments backwards and forwards and upside down. Not only know what they mean, but they're supposed to be the examples for the entire nation of Israel. And now they put Jesus on trial. So let's see who follows the Ninth Commandment. Those who have arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and then sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence. These are supposed to be the best and the brightest of the Israelite community that are supposed to know better. And what are they doing? They're actively trying to break the ninth commandment. Why? So they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Again, they're supposed to know better, aren't they? Finally, two false witnesses came forward and declared, This fellow here said that I am able to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Now that's an interesting statement, because Jesus did say that, and even though these false witnesses were trying to incriminate Jesus, so their intentions of their heart were very wrong, Jesus meant that it wasn't the physical temple that he could tear down, but the temple that is his body. But still their intentions were wrong. And how did they respond? How did they respond? The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Now remember, Jesus never sinned. He never made a mistake, which means he never lied. How does he respond? Yes, it is as you say. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds with heaven. He was being truthful when he was a witness. The high priest tore his clothes and said, He's spoken blasphemy. Do you need any more witnesses? Look, you've heard this blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Remember, he didn't do anything wrong. Remember when he was asked to be truthful, he was. They spit in his face, stuck struck him with their fists, others slapped him, and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? 
So that's one example of how people lived out the <coughs> commandment. And I hope you all agree that they failed miserably. But let's see Peter, the man who walked on water and saw these amazing miracles. Verse 69, Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, Weren't you with Jesus of Galilee, she said. Now again, remember what he said. Even if all fall away, I will not disown you, Jesus. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. What a terrible lie. Verse 71, they went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and saw the people there. Hey, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. So now he's got a second opportunity to speak the truth. What does he do? He denied it again, and now this time with an oath. So it's kind of like saying, I swear, I don't know the man. Making it even worse, his lie. A little, little while later, those standing went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them. So it's basically, remember the third commandment? Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Here Peter, who saw this amazing miracle, promising he'd never disown the Lord, says, I swear to God, I don't know that guy. And immediately, just as Jesus said, that rooster crowed. And we know from the Gospel of Luke that he was in eye shot of Jesus. And when that rooster crowed, he looked right at Jesus, looked him right in the eye. Can you imagine how he felt? Three times he lied about not even knowing Jesus. He went outside and wept bitterly. I would have cried too. When you're given a perfect opportunity to actually show that you understand what God has commanded. When Jesus has given you the opportunity to speak truth, when you're put in a position to declare the glories of the Lord, He fell short but just one time, not just two times but three times. You and I are put in situations every single day where the Lord puts us in a place and says, okay, let's see what they're going to do. Sometimes we're afraid. Sometimes we know that if we're truthful, it may hurt people. Sometimes we may even lose our job if we're truthful. But when we are put in a position where the Lord says, let's see what they do, it is my hope that you see Peter fell hard when he was put in this place. And so in closing, you need to know that you're not alone in this. You need to know that you have an ally. And so I want to, can I go to the next slide a minute? There you are. I want to jump to the Gospel of John. Remember, John's all about truth. So now the third trial, he went before the Sanhedrin, went before Herod, and now he's once again under oath in a court setting for Pontius Pilate. He went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Well, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus said, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Ha! Jesus answered, well, you're right to say that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. We're almost, and, and it already feels it's like Christmas, right? They already got the Christmas decorations. Everybody's got, got Christmas toys. And it's not Christmas yet. We still got to thank God for what we have at Thanksgiving. But we're getting close to Christmas. The time of the year where we promote the truth of what happened at the manger. And here Jesus gives us that reason. For this reason I was born. For this reason I came into the world. Why? To testify the truth. Everyone who listens to me on the side of truth. Everyone who listens is on the side of truth. So remember, every day we're put in these situations. Are we going to be honest? And if we say, no, we're going to lie, Jesus is saying, look, everyone who sides with me is speaking the truth. And then look what Pilate says. What is truth? Pilate didn't know the Ten Commandments. 2,000 years later, a society is still asking that question, what is truth? You and I know what that truth is. 
You and I have been given this amazing word, this amazing law, and the Ten Commandments and the Gospel. We know what truth is. But like I said, we're not alone. What I think we need is a truth filter. That's right. So often, so often, we are put in positions where we are given so much information, it's hard to discern what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's not, and it becomes sort of murky. And if, like Pilate, you don't know the difference between truth and a lie, you think <coughs> dirty, murky water like this is somehow normal. But again, we've been given something amazing. Have you seen these bottles yet? These are really, these are those Brita water bottles. Okay. In the nozzle here is a filter. Because of what Christ did for you and I, not only do we have God's Word, but we have His Spirit working within us to discern what is right and what is wrong, and so it kind of functions like a filter. So in our life, when we are inundated with all this information and all this murkiness, and it fills up our life, we have a wonderful way of discerning what is right and what is wrong, because we have this filter. Hopefully this will work, right? And when we finally take a drink, it's filtered out all of that junk that we are taking. And I'll tell you what, the truth is refreshing. And once you've tasted the truth and you've seen the truth, anytime someone comes up to you and says, yada, 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 blah, 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 I'm lying at you, you're like, ugh. I don't want any part of that. Because now you have a filter. And so as you leave this place today, as you go out to your world, don't be surprised if you're going to be put in a big place where God's going to say, let's see if they're honest. <laughs> and someone's going to tell you something, and as soon as the words come out of your mouth, you're going to be like, ah, what a lie. Don't forget that you have a filter. Because it was Jesus himself who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that little hair is on the back of your neck, and that voice in your head, that's the Holy Spirit, the voice of truth, telling you to be on the right side of things, and to speak truth no matter where you are, no matter what communication you give. Please, pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the ninth commandment. We thank you for being our truth filter, when we study God's Word, when we learn it, it becomes part of us. With your Holy Spirit helping, we are able to discern what is truth. Help us to speak truth, Lord. Help us to discern what is not of you, but that is lies. And help us to declare who you are, no matter what area or context we find ourselves in. Help us to listen to the voice of truth. In Jesus' name, amen.